Welcome to lecture three. Uh, this is definitions and direct proofs. And uh, perhaps for the last time I'm displaying this uh, QR mark, but by now hopefully you've all bookmarked it if you're going to be participating in the polls. Otherwise you can always go to the tinyurl.com FPM poll. I'm going to be talking about definitions, proofs and examples a lot in this module and in the introductory session I already indicated that uh, definitions might be important and we'll see that more and more often and uh, yes, have a look at the feedback on what went wrong in January 2013 and in January 2014. Um, where you'll find that basically students were a little bit unclear on the precise definitions of the concepts and certainly many students didn't appear to have much practice uh, didn't appear to be very fluent at actually using the precise definitions to get at what we needed uh, so I'll give you as much practice as I can in working from definitions there's various question sheets as well that can help you. So I've got a question sheet, um, one of the question sheets I issued called, mm, I think it's called something like more practice with definitions, proofs and examples um, and you should work your way through that until, uh, and there are some questions there which once you've written the definition down the proof is about two more lines or one more line um, and then there are some later questions where you have to do a bit more work but certainly that sheet gives you a lot of practice. Um, there's about, uh, there's a lot of question sheets produced by a previous lecturer called Dr. Zacharias and I've put all of his question sheets already on the Moodle page so you can get at those, give you a lot more practice um, the book of, uh, I think it's Liebeck has got uh, lots and lots of questions in um, so there's loads of questions you can practice on and those questions will help you to see whether you understand the definitions whether you can work with definitions whether you can write what I would regard as, as relatively routine proofs but for you they're not routine yet so once you've practiced once you've practiced enough hopefully some of the proofs at least will become routine to you and the more you practice the more different kinds of proof will become routine and the more of the proofs from this module will actually write themselves right okay so let's have a look at some definitions, terminology and notation about integers. So we've already discussed the integers Z. So that's all the integers, positive, negative and zero. And the natural numbers, which in this module start from one. So zero isn't included in our natural numbers in this module, which is useful if you want to divide by them, because you mustn't divide by zero. So remember, in this module, naught is not a natural number. Natural numbers go 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, so I'm only going to define divisible by for natural numbers in this module. Uh, you can talk about divisibility by negative integers as well. You might uh, discuss whether or not you could talk about divisibility by zero. Is zero divisible by zero in, in any sense at all? Um, it is in one sense and not in another. I'm going to avoid that issue by simply only defining divisible by positive integers in this module. Um, but I think divisibility by negative integers is a reasonable thing to talk about as well. Um, I just won't um, bother with it. So, so n, for the moment, is any integer, which could be zero, but m can't be zero, in fact I'm going to insist that m is positive and I'm going to say what it means to say that n is divisible by m ok and uh, there's an interesting thing here in the way mathematicians use the word if in a definition when, when you're defining something and you're a mathematician and you write the word if, you actually mean this is what it means so that's really an if and only if 
right? Um, if this isn't true, then it's not divisible by n. So you could say we should use if and only if, but it's a, a hundreds of years old tradition that when you're making a definition, you write if to mean this is what we mean. <laughs> or So I'll, that if, strangely enough, means, means that. Okay. Normally, if you eat an if, it's different from if and only if, but definitions are an exception. So there's something funny about mathematicians' use of if in definitions. Okay, so n is divisible by m. That means that the sum integer k, so that n is equal to k times m. Um, and equivalently, you could say that n divided by m should be an integer. And you could use that if you like. Uh, so, saying that n over m is divisible by uh, n over m is an, an integer, it's perhaps a, another way of thinking about it. Um, if you were going to talk about divisible by zero, these two aren't the same. Because zero is an integer times zero, but you're not allowed to say that zero over zero is an integer, because zero over zero doesn't make sense. So if you were thinking about zero, there would be a problem. But I'm avoiding that issue by sticking to dividing by only positive integers at the moment. Okay, so right. Now, here's some notation. This vertical line can cause trouble, um, because... When you see this vertical line here, m vertical line n, you're not dividing m by n, you're dividing n by m. It's the wrong way around from what you might expect. That vertical line symbol is pronounced divides. So what that says is m divides n, and that, I don't know why mathematicians decided to do it that way around, but this, is the, um, this is, means that, in this case, it's n that is divisible by m. And that's the tradition. It's been going for hundreds of years, and I'm not going to reverse it today. So, m divides n, that means, another way of saying it is m is a factor, or a divisor of m. Um, these all mean the same thing, and it's n is a multiple of m, and uh, n is divisible by m, right? But the line may be the wrong way, wrong way around from what you expect, so watch out for that. And you need to know this notation and be clear about it. Now I'm going to issue a notation sheet later this week, assuming the uh, printers get it printed in time. Uh, so uh, I shall issue you with a common notation sheet and you'll have it available, but not in the exam. If by the time you get to the exam, you need to know this notation and be fluent with it and be able to work with it and not be unsure which way around it is. Okay? So, um, so we're, I'm going to give you a little test in a minute, so we'll see whether you've remembered which way around it is. Um, and, oh, here's another funny thing about these definitions. This, in this case, this gets a and not otherwise. So again, Again, it's in sort of if and only if. These are the only times that we'll say that n is divisible by m, and that m divides n, and that m is a factor of n, and that m is a divisor of n, and all that. Um, and, uh, of course, if it isn't, then we need... Uh, there's a nice symbol here for does not divide. So this one here, m does not divide n, Just to remind you which way around it is, so m does not divide n in this setting, <coughs> if and only if n over m is not in z. Okay? Um, we're assuming that, of course, uh, m is not zero here. In fact, we've got... Uh, 
that's when n is an integer and m is an actual number. Okay? So there's our terminology and our notation. And I've given you a formal definition that tells you when it's true and when it's false. And now if you've got an integer n and a positive integer m, then either m divides n or m doesn't divide n, and it'll be exactly one or the other. Okay, so let's see what we've got. I'll give you another definition, and another one that students have got wrong in the exam before, so if it turns up, you have to try to do better than previous years. And I recommend giving the definition I've given you. If you do give a different definition, it needs to be clear, unambiguous, and correct. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as what I've given you, but don't start saying a number, because there's so many different kinds of number. Um, a lot of people in the exam last year started talking about a number, um, but there are real numbers, rational numbers, complex numbers, positive integers, <coughs> negative integers. Um, there's so many different kinds of number, that uh, if you start saying it's a number with some properties, I won't know what you mean. Okay, so no longer acceptable to say a number. Um, so I say it has to be an integer. Um, I also insist that I want to avoid one, so I say it's an integer p which is greater than one. So two is the first possibility. And p should not be divisible by any natural numbers other than one and p. Notice I said natural numbers because, of course, um, there is the possibility that you, uh, if you were going to talk about divisibility by negative integers, then you could hit the problem that you were divisible by minus 1 and minus p as well. Okay? If you divide an integer by minus 1, you get an integer. If you divide an integer by minus itself, you'll get minus 1. So play it safe and talk about only divisibility by natural numbers. And the only natural numbers dividing it should be 1 and p. And we've eliminated 1 by saying that p should be greater than 1. So there are various other ways of writing that. In the first lecture, I think I said p greater or equal to 2, which has the same effect. Okay? Um, but it caused trouble in the past. So it caused trouble in January 2014, where people weren't able to give a clear definition. It caused trouble in January 2013, where a lot of students thought that 1 was a prime number and got the answers wrong for that reason. So... Here comes a quick quiz, or a quick question, and let me just zero the answers for this. Okay, I've deleted all the answers. Now, there are six statements here. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves about them, looking back at the definition and the notation to try and make sure you've got it the right way around. And you need to decide, obviously you want to decide for each statement whether it's true or false, which will require you to know the definitions and know the notation and so on. Um, once you've done that, do a count up. Of course, it's possible that you'll get the right number for the wrong reasons. We'll sort that out separately. But uh, talk amongst yourselves, and I'll give you a few minutes to try and work out how many of these are right. And I'll do the same, because I've forgotten how many are right. OK? <laughs> Got 119 votes so far. <coughs> 130. OK, as you can see, we've got a massive majority in favour of A, which I'm very pleased to see. So most people believe that two of these statements are true, which is correct. Let's just see which ones are true and which ones are false, just in case anybody was wondering about that. Um, this first one says 27 divides 9, or which is saying 9 is divisible by 27. That's false. Uh, 9 over 27. Remember, it's the wrong way round from what you might expect. That's not an integer. 
at 4 divided 0 is true. Because 0 over 4 is an integer. Minus 3 of the prime number is false by our definition. Um, minus 3 has got a lot of properties in common with prime numbers. Um, it doesn't have any interesting factors. Um, it's basically it's divisible by 1 and 3 and minus 1 and minus 3 if you allow those. So minus 3 is just about as prime as 3 is, but it doesn't fit our definition of a prime number because we said that it had to be an integer that was greater than 1. So it gets across here. The official definition of pri the prime numbers, they start from 2. Uh, when you do later courses in algebra, you may come across what's known as a prime element of a ring. When you get to there, you'll find that minus 3 is just as good as 3 is, um, as being a prime element of the ring of integers. But uh, that's not the definition we're working with at the moment. Okay. Uh, 25 does not divide 100 is false, because 100 is divisible by 25. So 25 does divide 100. 12 divided by 3 is true, and I don't need to tell you why, and 50 divides 5 is false. So there you are, there are the two. Um, I shall assume that the vast majority who got the answer right picked the correct two, but if you didn't pick the correct two, um, you should think about it um, and go back and revisit the definitions, because these are basic definitions that we will be working with throughout. Okay? More definitions, even and odd. Now, this came up in a previous lecture because uh, the question arose whether zero was even or not. Well, for us, zero counts as even because n can be any integer here and we say, once you've got an integer, you can talk about whether it's even or odd. And if it's not an integer, then it doesn't make sense, okay? Okay? Uh, Real num you don't talk about real numbers being even or odd, unless they happen to be integers as well. Um, it doesn't make much sense to talk about a rational number being even or odd, though there might be some scope for looking at the denominator or something like that. But uh, <coughs> generally, I'm reserving the terms even and odd for integers, um, and integers will either be even or odd. That's actually not completely obvious. Um, that e integers are either even or odd, even by this definition, um, but we're going to take it as self-evident because I'm going to tell you a bit more later anyway about what I call the quotient and remainder result, um, which is really something called the division algorithm, um, the Euclidean division algorithm. It'll be a special case, um, and it's something you've been doing since primary school anyway. Right, so, so n could be zero, n is an integer, it could be 0, okay? And we say it's even if n is divisible by 2, which is that n over 2 is an integer, right? And it's odd if n minus 1 is divisible by 2. That is, that m minus 1 over 2 is an integer. <laughs> or you can use the other definition. And uh, let me point out uh, another thing. OK, so here's uh, some equivalent ways of doing odd or even. So you can use these as well. I'll, I'll take these equivalent definitions of being odd or even. These are the ones you get using the other version of divisible by 2. Um, n is even. That's if and only if. So it's a two-way implication. Um, there is an integer k such that n is equal to 2 times k. That comes from the other notion of divisible by 2. And it's odd 
if and only if this two-headed arrow means that it's true if the other thing's true and only if the other thing is true. So they're equivalent statements. Um, that's if and only if there is a K in Z with N equals 2K plus 1. You may wonder where that comes from. That's the... Uh, M minus 1 being divisible by 2 means that M minus 1 is 2 times K for some K. And M minus 1 being 2 times K is the same as N being 2K plus 1. So this is what you get if you use the other notion of divisible by 2. Okay? And you're welcome to use these versions of even or not. And I think for this theorem, these equivalent versions are actually slightly easier to use. So these are standard equivalent definitions of even stroke odd integers. Okay? And if it's a standard equivalent definition, that means you can use that. If you get asked in the exam for a definition of what does it mean for an integer to be odd, I don't mind whether you use this one um, or this one. Okay? Um, as long as you give an unambiguous, clear and correct standard equivalent definition, that's okay. The problems start when you give a vague, ambiguous, incorrect definition, which you can't work with. That's where the problems come. So, um, we'll see lots of proofs, and we'll see proofs will heavily be based on the definitions. And this first easy theorem is going to be a theorem that comes quickly using the definitions. It's going to be a direct proof. A direct proof means that we start with the information given and the definitions that we know, and we argue forwards from that, make deductions until we arrive at the conclusion we want. Right? So, in this theorem, we're given the n is an integer, and then we have two different things to deal with. First, we're supposed to show that if n is odd, then n squared is odd as well. Secondly, we're supposed to show that if n is even, then n squared is divisible by 4. That's two separate proofs, but each of them is a one-way implication. So we're going to make the assumptions given and make logical deductions from that. And this will be our forward direct proof. So it's two different proofs, so we'll start by proving A. OK, we're given that n is odd. That means there's some positive integer k, no, sorry, some integer k, so that n equals 2k plus 1. What do I do? I took the information given. I'm told that n is an odd integer. I've gone to my definition of odd. I've gone to one of my standard equivalent ones because that's an easy one to work with. There are usually lots of different ways to prove things, so this proof I'm giving you is not the only correct proof. But I'm going to give you a proof based on this standard equivalent definition of odd. I'll add in a comment. The comments I put in square brackets are optional. Okay, if I put a comment in square brackets, that means I'm giving you extra information... You can include this extra information um, if you want, but you don't have to. This is a standard equivalent definition of odd. Okay, and that's what we're using there. Now, I'm supposed to be proving that in this case, n squared is also odd, so I'm going to have a look at what n squared is. n squared is 2k plus 1 all squared. Uh, I'm going to use the binomial theorem, which, um, but at least a special case where you square things. Um, you can multiply it out and add it, but uh, you should work. I remember in the past, 
um, I set a question for second years which involved in cubing something. And um, they multiplied it all out and, and they didn't use the binomial theorem. So it was just a, a plus B all cubed or something. And, and everybody, a whole load of people in second year multiplied it out and they didn't remember the binomial expansion. And uh, half of them multiplied it out incorrectly and uh, the results were rather random. In this case, um, Here's a chance of me to get it wrong. That's 2k squared plus 2 times 2k times 1 plus 1 squared. Okay. You, you don't really need to include that step. Just in case you're wondering where this comes from, that's 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. Okay, and that's supposed to be odd. If it's odd, that means I'm supposed to be writing it as twice an integer plus one. So let's write it as twice an integer plus one to demonstrate it's odd. I wrote it as two times 2k squared plus 2k plus one. Now that's two times an integer plus one. It's not the same integer as before, but it doesn't matter. Any, if you ever get something that's 2 times an integer plus 1, that's one of the standard equivalent definitions of being odd. So, so if I just note that that's an integer, so this is odd. Uh, later on, uh, that proves that if you squared odd integer, you get an odd number. Because we've shown that it always ends up as 2 times an integer plus 1, which makes it odd. Uh, later on, we're going to look at something called modular arithmetic, um, which will make life a lot easier when you come to this sort of thing. Um, and in modular arithmetic, um, if you work modulo 2, then the odd numbers are the ones that are basically the same as 1. <coughs> and the even ones are the same as zero, and if you square one, you get one, and so it's still odd, and things like that. Modular arithmetic makes life a lot easier and quicker when you're doing this sort of thing. But since we haven't done that yet, we're doing direct proofs, easy proofs from definitions at the moment. Okay, so let's do B as well. Uh, this time N is even. Now, we want to show that n squared is divisible by 4. Um, as usual, the first thing we want to do is to use the definition, or a definition of even. Let's go back and decide which one to use. Um, I'm going to use this one, this standard equivalent definition of even. You take the one that you think will give you the easiest proof generally, once you've got several standard equivalent definitions, I'm going to make it so that there's, that there's an integer k so that n equals 2k. And we'll work with that one. Okay, so we go back. Given that n is even, there is an integer k with n equals 2k. And it's n squared we're interested in. <coughs> n squared is 4k squared. So n squared over 4 is equal to k squared is in z. If you square an integer, you get an integer, of course. So n squared is the multiple of 4. And I'm using so too often. It's better to use different ones. This shows thus. Well, I'll leave it there. So n squared is uh, a multiple of 4. As required. I can use this 
little square box, that means we finished the proof. Okay? You can do various things to show you finished a proof. Um, you can write QED. Um, I, I just write this square box. That's the easiest one. The proof is finished. Right, so that was two examples of direct proof. Have we got any questions about those two proofs? Yes? Yes? Okay, so I gave a definition of multiple of four earlier. It's the same as being divisible by four, or four divides it, or n squared by four. So those are all the same. So multiple of four in this module um, is, it, that's what I'm defining it. I'm allowing negative things to be multiples of four in this module. Okay, um, that is an issue. You might think that the multiples of four are four, eight, twelve, sixteen, and so on. Um, but uh, we're the multiple of the four in this module also include 0, minus 4, minus 8. Again, you need to know which, which scenario you're in, uh, but I've given you a definition of multiple of four, and that's the one we'll be working with in this module. Do we have any other questions about those proofs? Okay. Right, so that was two examples of direct proof. We had information available. We made deductions from that information. We used the definitions and we argued forwards until we got to the, direct, until we got to the conclusion we wanted. And when you're doing that, you're also allowed to use any previous results you had and that can help you, okay? Um, and later in the module, we may quote results from earlier in the module to prove results. So there'll be standard results from earlier in the module, which I will quote and say, as we know, this means this, and so we'll use that, quoting this standard result from earlier. Uh, it's risky to quote a result from later in the module to prove an earlier one, the reason being that it might be that when we come to the later one, we're going to use the earlier one to prove that. And... That would be a circular proof. If you use one result to prove another one and then use the other result to prove it, then in fact all you've shown is that each one implies the other, but uh, you haven't managed to establish either yet, unless you can show that one of them comes from something else. So that's why it's usually risky to use later proofs, use later results to prove the earlier ones. There are exceptions, though. You can always chase it through, and you can always have a look at what depended on what, and you can sort of work out a little tree of dependencies of which results were used to prove which results. And sometimes there are quicker proofs later, like later when we do modular arithmetic, you can come back and give easier proofs of the results I just gave based on modular arithmetic because the modular arithmetic will not depend on the results we just proved there. Okay. Uh, as I say, it is a bit risky to use results of later to prove results that are earlier. We try and have a coherent logical development in this module um, to avoid circularity. Now, it turns out that although mathematicians tend to act as if uh, mathematicians tend to act as if you know it's natural to write down these forward direct proofs and so on quite often the proofs are discovered backwards. They're discovered backwards um, by people figuring out where do we have to go to get to the desired solution. Um, that's okay. You, you like solving a maze. Sometimes the best way to solve a maze is to, is to actually work backwards from the end. Um, that can be easier. Especially sort of children's mazes are often designed so they're really easy to solve backwards, whereas they can be relatively hard to solve forwards. Uh, so Figuring out where you need to go often does help you figure out what you need to do next. But the problem is that um, you mustn't actually write down a backwards proof. Okay? So what you mustn't do when you come to your final proof is start by writing down the result you want to be true and then start making deductions from it. If you do that... 
for a start, it suggests that you're trying to prove the wrong implication. Suppose you've been asked to show that if A is true, then B is true. And you write down B and start making deductions until you get to A. Then what you've, done, what you've actually done is prove that if B is true, then A is true. And that's different. Um, you'll be learning all about that in ACF. Um, it's a notion of the converse of the statement you want. If you want to show that one statement forces another one to be true, you mustn't start proving the other direction, even if it's true. And sometimes the other direction is true, but sometimes the other direction is false. So I'm going to start with a false proof of a false statement, which I'm going to get by starting from the false statement and deducing a true one from it. Because it's very easy to deduce true statements from false ones. In fact, um, it turns out that if you assume any false statement, you can deduce absolutely everything from it. Anything you want. For example, you start from 1 equals 2, you can prove all numbers are equal um, rather easily, and um, anything else you want, you can prove as well. But of course, you started from assuming 1 equals 2, so it's not surprising that you could prove all sorts of dark things. But you can also prove all the true things in the world as well, if you start from assuming that 1 equals 2. So uh, it's just not very helpful, because you started from uh, something that's false. Right, so here's a false theorem with a false proof, using what I call backwards logic. OK? Now, because it's backwards logic, what, what it's actually a proof of is that if x equals 0, then x is a real number. Um, which is not a surprising statement, OK? So that's what this result will prove. But it's claimed to be a proof that if x is a real number, then x equals 0. OK. So how does it go? If x equals 0, then 2x equals 0 as well, because you can double both sides. I can even tell you what logic I'm using. Double both sides. OK, then we'll subtract x from both sides to get x equals minus x. And rewrite that as x equals minus 1 times x. From there, I can square both sides. But if x is equal to minus 1 times x, then x squared is going to be equal to minus 1 squared times x squared. But minus 1 squared is 1, so that's telling that x squared equals x squared. And that's true, so the result is proved. OK? If x equals 0, then x squared equals x squared. One could have done that a little uh, more quickly, of course, because if x equals 0, then x squared is certainly equal to x squared. OK? Because 0 squared equals 0. But uh, I decided to go through a few extra steps in the middle. OK? Um, so the result is proved. OK, well... I went through some steps in that argument. None of the steps were false. Indeed, the conclusion, if x equals 0, then x squared is x squared, is true. Um, but since the final statement is true and the original statement is false, one of these steps must be not reversible. Um, who can tell me which step is not reversible? Yes? Yes, when you square both sides... Um, that's not a reversible step. You see, for most real numbers x, it's not true that x equals minus 1 times x. In fact, that's only true for the real number 0. Um, whereas, for all real numbers, it's true that x squared equals minus 1 squared times x squared. So, this step is not reversible. So if you start for a false statement and make deductions, you may well end up at a true statement, but that doesn't tell you that the thing you started with was true. Okay? So that's the big danger. And uh, I've seen a lot of backwards logic used in exams. And I'm going to show you one that came up in the 2013 January exam. 
This time it's a true statement, but the proof is going to be backwards. And uh, a backwards proof of a true statement is just as bad as a backwards proof of a false statement. Um, it's got no more validity to it than the backwards proof of the false statement had. Okay? The only difference being that if you do, um, uh, again, whenever you prove, uh, whatever proof you write down, if the steps are valid, it will prove something. But if what it proves is the implication in the wrong direction, then you're going to get very few marks um, compared to, to what you're expected to prove. Okay, so here is an invalid backwards proof of a true statement. And this was a small bit of a question from the January 2013 exam. And here's a true statement that you're supposed to prove. You're given that n is a natural number and n is greater or equal to 3, and you're asked to prove that m minus 1 over n is greater or equal to 2 thirds. And let me show you what most of the students wrote. Something like 70 or 80 percent, I think, wrote the following. They said, if m minus 1 over n is greater or equal to 2 thirds, then multiplying up by n and then by 3, and um, actually there was even a problem there in the exam because I didn't actually tell them that m was a natural number. I just told them that it was an integer. So, um, but I told them it was an integer with n greater or equal to 3. Okay? Um, but... Uh, I'm being a bit more generous here, so I am saying that n is an actual number. So n is greater than zero, so you are allowed to multiply by n. You're allowed to multiply by n here, and it doesn't change the inequality round. If you multiply by a negative number, actually the inequality would reverse. So you have to watch out for that as well. Um, but it, this is okay. 3 is positive, and n is positive, so you haven't messed up your inequality. Actually, I'll, I'll even say that n is greater than zero. That's even better for inequalities. Okay, so inequalities do get preserved when you multiply by positive numbers. That's okay. So, multiplying up. So, m minus 1 is greater than 2n over 3. Um, 3n minus 3 is greater than 2n. That's just the multiplying out by n and 3. Subtracting 2 from both sides gives m minus 3 greater equal to 0, which is the same as saying that n is greater equal to 3, which is what we wanted. Or is it? Okay, so in fact, what is proved, this is a correct proof. This shows that for natural number n, if m minus 1 over n is greater than 2 thirds, then n is greater than 3. It is a correct proof of that. But unfortunately, what you're actually asked to show is that if n is greater than 3, then m minus 1 over n is greater than 2 thirds. So you proved it the wrong way around. That's backwards logic and only obtained... And if you get anything from that, it's charity marks because it's got nothing to do with what I actually asked. Yes? So you wrote it down the opposite. Yes. If you, if, you now, if you actually said... If you wrote, worked it the other way around, it would be a, a correct proof as long as when you got to the crucial bit, um, you needed to know that N was positive. Okay. Uh, there's a crucial bit. Yes. Yeah. So, because you started with n to 3, you know that n's positive and you're safe. And you can do it that way around. Hmm? Yeah, so you'll be dividing by n and you'll be dividing by 3. And so, you can reverse the argument here with care and get a correct proof. Right? It's not a particularly good proof. There are some much better proofs of this result. But yes, if you reverse it, it's okay. But if you write an argument down like this, um, and if you miss out the English as well, if you write, 
n minus 1 over n greater than 2 thirds, n minus 1 greater than 2 over 3, 3 n minus 3 greater than 2n, n minus 3 greater than 0. If you don't include the English, you're assumed to be arguing forwards. So by default, by default, when you write an argument, it's assumed that you're deducing each statement from the one before. But if you include some backwards arrows, you can say, this would follow from knowing that this was true, which would follow from knowing that this was true. Uh, you can convert it into a, a correct proof that way. That's, and this is what I mean by proofs can be discovered backwards, but they should then be written down forwards. Okay? <laughs> Um, and so, having done the working here, you could then write down a correct forwards proof, even though it's not the best proof, because there are some much easier proofs of this result. Okay? But, I can't remember, there were a, a number of marks going through this, and people who wrote down the backwards proof got about one mark. Um, so, uh, because it's, it's as bad as that. If you, write, if you use backwards logic, then you haven't proved the right thing. You, you proved the wrong result. Okay, uh, any more questions about the... Back yes? Um, it's, it's, okay, so if I had said instead that n was an integer, but with n greater than 3, then fortunately you then know that it's a natural number because it's greater than 3. Okay, so it actually makes no difference. But for the backwards proof, you have to be more careful. And in fact, it's not true for integers that n minus 1 over n greater equal to 2 thirds implies that n is greater equal to 3. If you take integers which are negative, there are plenty of negative integers which have n minus 1 over n greater equal to 2 thirds. So it really does matter. If I hadn't told you it was an actual number, and, and a lot of people in their proof didn't tell me what they were assuming, so in fact, many people's arguments also broke down because n could have been a negative integer in what they wrote. So that's something else to watch out for. Okay?